And I've been thinking for a while about how to kick off this conference today. And I started thinking about the only question that kept coming back and back in my head is, how did we all get here? How did all 700 of us get into this room? And Ashoka as an organization has been around since 1980. But Ashoka U has only been around since 2008, right when the economic crisis hit. We had to define what is a changemaker campus and demonstrate a successful model or the entire program would have been cut. We really only had a year to prove ourselves. And everyone knows that higher ed a year is like a blink of an eye. It's like, you want me to start a class next semester? I was thinking like a year from now, maybe, you know. Um, so this sounds a bit dramatic, but Ashoka moves very fast and we practice what we preach in terms of entrepreneurship. And we had to provide value quickly or else it would have been over. But we knew the payoff was that we could have a community who sees that the world is changing and that the education system has to change too and that we could do something about it together. So we started off seven years of learning, adapting, millions of emails, loads of laughter. And you know, you guys have all been there. Everyone here has started something new. So we also had a lot to learn. So today, it will be my pleasure just to share a few learnings to kick us off uh, for our three days of the Ashoka U Exchange. The first lesson we learned was that we had to listen build trust and understand the problem. And there's no better place for storytelling than sitting around a fire pit. <laughs> so imagine this, this was the fall of 2008. This was the first Ashoka U exchange, a slightly different scene. <laughs> we had Cornell, Johns Hopkins, George Mason and the University of Maryland, which is actually our host for this weekend. This rowdy bunch immediately threw out the agenda that the Ashoka U team had so carefully planned. <laughs> we had brainstorming exercises, mapping exercises, content that we thought was really meaningful. But what we realized is that we just needed to sit together, to listen, to build trust, and to talk about the problem. Now, higher education overall, in general, is not the problem. We thought it had quite a few good things that were, that were worth keeping. But we did see that there were structural issues that were holding us back from our aspirations. We were not meeting the needs and interests of all students. Faculty needed institutional support to provide more experiential learning opportunities. And to solve real world problems, we had to work across disciplines. And universities typically aren't organized this way. One of my favorite quotes and anecdotes from over the year is uh, Lizzie Pollock and Alan Harlem from Brown University, who you can meet this weekend. Hey guys. Um, and they said when students come into their office jazzed up about a new idea. So they come in, they're gonna start X business for Y widget. They listen generously and then ask the students to come back when they can talk about the problem or the issue or why they had that idea. Not just the shiny idea on its own. So only good ideas can come from better understanding the problem. Once we had a better sense of what we were working with, we, had to, we realized that we had to have teams to solve these issues. We had to have students leading as the main drivers of what kind of education would best prepare them for their futures. An entrepreneurial change leader who could work full time on building a vision and growing new programs. Faculty, staff, and administrators from across disciplines that can make offerings truly interdisciplinary. However, with such big diverse teams, we had other problems. <laughs> we could not communicate with this large diverse group. We had serious issues with clarity and jargon. What are we talking about anyways? You might even be asking yourself as you look through the program. <laughs> what is social entrepreneurship? What is social innovation change making? Uh, the list really goes on and the real zinger that maybe some of you have heard is why should I care anyways? Now don't get me wrong, we still have a lot of work to do, but I think we're getting better. So today I wanted to share some of my favorite definitions with you to get us kicked off this morning. So what does Ashoka mean anyways? How many people in the room know what Ashoka means? Okay, good, I'm glad I brought this one up. <laughs> Handful. <laughs> so it turns out we were named after an, uh, a leader who unified the Indian subcontinent in third century BC. 
So when we talk about how we got here, that was a really long time ago in terms of when we're starting. He renounced violence and dedicated his entire life to social and economic welfare. Ashoka is the earliest example of a social entrepreneur. And today, as an organization, Ashoka has recognized over 3,000 Ashoka Fellows as leading social entrepreneurs in 70 countries. Beyond recognizing individual entrepreneurs, Ashoka is increasingly known for building networks of innovators who together are creatively solving some of today's biggest social challenges. But what is social entrepreneurship? Ashoka's founder and CEO, Bill Drayton, coined this term. He sees small business owners and entrepreneurs differently. Social entrepreneurs don't just support a cause or build a single school. They change the entire system. Well-known examples are Muhammad Yunus with microfinance or Wendy Kopp with Teach for America. And you'll meet other incredible social entrepreneurs here at the Ashoka U Exchange. In my mind this morning, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about Ali Raza, who I haven't met yet, I've only met over Skype, who's visiting us from Pakistan, and he's launched an entire national youth movement. Or Catherine Hall Trujillo, who's been with us since the very beginning, who is a social entrepreneur in residence at Tulane University. She's changed the expectations around healthy outcomes for young babies who are born by at-risk mothers. Their ideas influence an entire region, an entire country, or even resonate globally. So why social innovation? Why throw another term in there? Um, you know, we've realized that the right answer to a problem is not always to start a new organization or a new idea. In fact, I think many of us would admit there's actually a lot of good ideas already out there. So when we tend to think of social innovation as a process to better understand the context and drive forward change that can be relevant in philanthropy, government, and corporations, or as an entrepreneur inside of an organization. It focuses on existing resources, assets, allies, and combines them in new ways to create a unique approach for the good of all. And if you disagree with me or have something to add, you'll actually have a chance to join a, com a conversation this afternoon in the program about the definition of social innovation. So the, 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 the conversation goes on. But finally, what is a change maker? At Ashoka, we have a, a pretty serious tension. Ashoka Fellows, under the Ashoka definition of social entrepreneurs, might be one in a million. Yet our vision as an organization is a world where everyone is a change maker. We see a change maker as anyone who steps up to solve a problem at whatever scale is required. In their family, in their community, in their country. A change maker sees a problem, identifies a new way forward, and guides others to contribute to the change that's needed. It is distinct from voting or volunteering. For example, in a voting context, a change maker would notice that someone in their family, or maybe at their office, or maybe an entire group of people are not voting. They'll figure out what's holding them back and would galvanize an effort to bring them to the polls. And the everyone a change maker vision is not just a motto, at, it really drives everything we do at Ashoka. And we believe that a world without change makers, without that mindset and skill set, that our society will suffer and those without these skills will be marginalized. Let's break that down even a little bit more. Society will suffer, pretty intense way to start a conference. Dun, dun, dun. Um, but I think all of us are pretty aware of the problems that are going around us and we can see that the speed of change is increasing. So as an example, consumerism is on the rise. More trash is piling up and that's happening at an increasing rate. We need more change makers to match the solutions to the speed of the problems. Another example I think about a lot is that we're glued to our iPhones, to our computers, with Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all kinds of new things. And without empathetic ethics, these forums can be used for humiliation or bullying. Or they could be used as productive spaces for social progress and protest. Society today, now more than ever, needs change makers to thrive. People will be marginalized. What's that all about? So think of a really successful person you know and that you respect. You could probably even look at the person sitting next to you. What's unique about this person? They initiate ideas and bring people along with them. They encourage other people's ideas and jump in as a valuable team member. They, their actions inspire us. Without the ability to collaborate in ambiguous environments, we will simply be less valuable. 
Those without practice honing changemaker skills will be marginalized as everything becomes decentralized and all of us are called upon to act. So the second lesson for the morning is that we need to clearly define our terms and the purpose of our work. And with these improved communications, we went from four changemaker campuses in 2008 to nine to 15 until seven years later. As of today, we'll be hitting our goal and announcing um, a big milestone of recognizing 30 changemaker campuses. <laughs> it's really amazing. <laughs> um, it's actually very touching. But here's another term. What is a changemaker campus? It's a designation, it's an ideal, but more importantly, it's a community of change makers. As I highlighted before, change maker campuses consist of students, change leaders, and change teams. But beyond that, at this year's exchange, we're gonna have presidents, provosts, and trustees to talk about why change making is essential for the future of higher education. Now, as a designation, no two change maker campuses are alike. You can review the full list of all 30 changemaker campuses in the back of your program. You'll see that they're pretty different. Based on students, we have 350 students to 75,000 students. They can be found from coast to coast in the US and increasingly around the world, in Mexico, Ireland, UK, Canada, and hopefully more soon. They represent different institutional types, liberal arts, faith-based, large state institutions. There's many roads to become a changemaker campus as long as the institution models social innovation by combining resources together in a new way for the good of all, and number two, they're committed to the interdisciplinary pursuit of social innovation as an educational opportunity for, for students to practice change making in today's world. And with those principles in place, it has been amazing to see what these colleges and universities could achieve. And you'll hear many of the stories at the exchange. And just a few examples, we've seen survey results that show students are going to changemaker campuses because of their social innovation and changemaking vision. New student orientation programs are being launched, living learning communities for social innovation for students actually to live and be immersed in this environment. New centers and co-working spaces, inspirational postgraduate fellowships and co-working for students to transition from college into the community. We see directors of social innovation, which you did not see in 2008, um, and even endowments now for this work. There's majors, minors, masters, and according to a recent survey, um, a census that we did on social innovation in higher ed, social innovation offerings have grown by 200% since 2008. <laughs> this is pretty radically awesome, yeah. So the evidence is piling up. This is definitely happening. Um, yet I was talking to a change leader earlier this week, and he was talking about the differences between structural change and cultural change. He said that he could point to new classes, he had a new master's, a new center, but when he actually was honest with himself and looked at the entire university culture, he said, you know, the culture wasn't there yet. There's something about the structure and the culture, and we're trying to do both. But what kind of cultural change are we trying to achieve with a change maker campus? Now, this is a framework that Ashoka has been thinking about lately just in relation to all of our work. Where the world has been and in what direction the world is going. And I'm, you can see the first thing on here, silos to the walls coming down. We think all of us think about our own institutions, our universities, our organizations. I'm sure you can think about silos that are still, still there. Or a culture where everyone contributes versus maybe what we see now where there might be a hierarchy or repetition of maybe old programs that really need some new innovation. So the question I think we have for us now is how can our university cultures embody the everyone a change maker mission? And while we believe institutional change is important because it does change a culture that will influence generations and it's a generation of change makers that are coming into our institutions, institutions are really, really hard to change. So the final lessons we've learned is that institutions are made up of individuals and we have to support each other to work towards this ideal. And that is why I love the exchange. It's been like Christmas waiting to like wake up and see you all this morning. Um, that we, I don't know, we just get to meet the most incredible individuals who are facing similar challenges. And so while you're here, I encourage you to draw on each other's energy and support each other. 
We've seen that the top goal for most participants is best practice sharing, and all of the content is crowdsourced directly from you. Seek out individuals from across disciplines and specifically who have different backgrounds because that's something unique about this conference that you can't find at most academic conferences. Listen for new perspectives. I know that I'm personally going to savor every single conversation I have here because it's a rare group of individuals and everyone has something to contribute. And together we're all learning how to better understand the problem, how to build teams, how to describe what we're doing, and how to change our institutions. However, what we might not always realize is that we're already on center stage. I am quite literally on center stage, but we all are. Um, <laughs> we've, we've really come a long way together, and even though we're still learning, we are leading. This field has grown immensely, and the exchange represents the heart of this movement. So let's support and challenge each other to get beyond jargon and connect with the heart of our work, to connect with why we're here and why we care about what we do not just for the sake of a new idea, but for the well-being of ourselves as human beings and for the well-being of our world. Thank you very much. So now that I've shared how far we've come, my colleague Rebecca Kagan will share a little bit more about the plans for our future. Thanks, Aaron. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. So Aaron's been describing to us what had to happen for all of us to get to this day. Not just for Ashoka U, but really for the entire community. It took a lot of hard work, a lot of defining terms, what is social innovation, what is social entrepreneurship, a lot of learning, a lot of trial and error, a lot of iteration, a lot of sending emails. I think we still send a lot of emails. A lot of hard work. I think that's what we all do. But as Aaron was saying, this is really just the beginning. This is really, I think, at a pivot point of what we as a network and as a community can really do to influence higher ed. I mean, if you look around this room, we have 700 people here who are interested in social entrepreneurship education. Back in 2008, when they started talking about Ashoka U, this would be hard to imagine. I mean, I don't know if you have the same experience I do, but when people ask me what I do for a living, I kind of sigh because I know I won't be able to explain in two sentences. And then I say, well, do you know what social entrepreneurship is? And a lot of the time they say, uh, is that something to do with social media? And the answer is no, it is not. But you know, more and more I think I'm getting the response, yeah, social entrepreneurship, sure, Ashoka. Like, oh, my daughter's interested in that. Or yeah, I have a friend who's doing that. And I think I'm hearing that response more and more just in the last several years. And so I'm sure that you've all seen that as well. And here we have 700 people who not only know what social entrepreneurship is, but it's what you do, right? Faculty and staff who are actually working deeply on this. So I'm really excited to tell you about why this moment in particular is so important for the Changemaker Campus Network and for the entire community, and then a little bit more about where we're going to go in the future. So what Aaron hinted at is that this right now, this very day, this very hour is an exciting moment for Changemaker Campus and for social innovation education. Now before I go into that more deeply, I just want to touch very briefly on what a Changemaker Campus is, which Aaron also already covered. So as she described, Changemaker campuses are colleges and universities around the world that have embedded social innovation as a core value deep into the university. The curriculum, co-curriculum, admissions, career services, you know, from students to faculty, staff, alumni, really deeply into the university. And just as Ashoka Fellows are these social entrepreneurs who have new and unique ideas about how to solve a pressing global problem, we really see Changemaker campuses on the same level. That you all have new ideas about what a university can look like. Not just Changemaker campuses, but all of you have a new vision of what a university is built for and what it can do in higher ed. And so our Changemaker Campus selection is actually modeled after a Shoka Fellow selection, which means, for one thing, it's long. We do a lot of interviews, we do a stakeholder engagement process, we do a site visit, we do a selection panel of experts, there's, there's a lot of emails, there's a lot of phone calls. It often takes one, two, sometimes even more years, and not all schools make it through the process. In fact, a very small number do. So it's really quite a testament to the schools that are Changemaker Campuses that they have received this designation. And these schools are here to sort of 
act as examples to all of us, to change our understanding of what it means to be a university, so that somebody doesn't have to ask, like, universities, what are they doing to make the world a better place, right? We can point to all of these changemaker campuses and say that's our vision of what higher ed could look like. So one of my favorite quotes about what it means to be a changemaker campus comes from one of our change leaders who said, the changemaker campus designation doesn't stop. It gives me something to go towards. It's my standard. It keeps me honest and it keeps me going. So that's what we try to do with the Changemaker Campus designation. Okay, so now that you have the background, let's get back to why this moment is so exciting. So in 2008, when Aaron and Marina were coming up with the idea of Ashoka U, they set this crazy hypothetical goal of 30 Changemaker campuses that would deeply embed social innovation as a core value. And it's almost hard to understand for me standing up here right now that that was such a crazy hypothetical idea. But at the time, they knew of about two social entrepreneurship faculty or directors who were doing this. And the idea that it could be deeply embedded at 30 schools, completely different types of schools, big, small, public, private, religious, secular, all different geographic areas, that was really something that was hard to imagine. So it's particularly exciting that we have, today, we're going to be designating our 30th Changemaker Campus. It's a big moment. But as we hit this moment, these are our 30 Changemaker campuses. So as we hit this moment, over the past year, we've started to ask, what is next for the network? We have our 30 Changemaker campuses. Are we done there? What happens now? And over the past year, the Changemaker campus network and the change leaders have been engaging in this conversation. And over the, these conversations, one theme has emerged, which is that this designation is not just for individual institutions. This designation is really about setting a standard that every faculty or staff in the entire world can look at and can say, that's what I want my institution to do. And so change leaders told us time and time again that their top priority was to make sure that this designation stayed relevant, that the standard kept getting higher and higher, because if that didn't happen, then people would no longer respect what it meant to be a change maker campus. They wouldn't have examples to look at. And so we started talking about what it would take to keep this designation fresh, keep the standard moving, and keep it that this is a designation that people around the world look to and emulate. So I'm delighted to announce renewal, which is a process of institutional recommitment to social innovation education that the change maker campuses are going to be going through every three to four years. This is a cohort-based process, which means that change leaders are going to be working together. It's focused on peer-to-peer -peer learning and sharing. And we're launching the very first cohort of renewal right now at the exchange. So it's also an exciting moment as we celebrate 30 Changemaker campuses. We also celebrate renewal and the next phase for the Changemaker campus. But so there's two things that strike me as really remarkable about renewal. And the first is that this signals something really strong about the state of the conversation, right? The change leaders could say, yeah, you know what? I think my house is relatively in order. I mean, there's more I could do, but we've got good curricular programs. We've got good co-curricular. We're ready to collaborate. We're ready to work across the network. We're ready to do more. And so the fact that not only do we have 30 change maker campuses, but that they're at such a high level is really extraordinary. But the thing that I'm even more touched by is that this idea of renewal came from the network. This idea of having to go through a process every four years to keep your designation was something that change leaders brought to us, which really, if you stop and think about it, is pretty extraordinary. That people would sit down and say, this is so important that this standard is raised, that I know it will be harder for me, I know my institution will have to do more, but I think that's good, both for my institution and for the entire network. And so that, I think that really signals something extraordinary and a really a huge move of selflessness on the part of the change leaders and on the part of the whole network that we're really putting the conversation and the community above our individual needs. So I, I'm going to make a prediction, which is that I think this is the next wave, the next thing for change-making education and social innovation education. I think it's going to be characterized by people who are acting in this selfless way, who are putting the institution uh, behind the needs of the entire network, who are putting field building, who are putting the entire vision ahead of themselves and what they think is best for you know, their own institution. I mean, hopefully they line up, but I think it's really just an extraordinary moment. One change leader even said, I don't know if my institution will pass, but I think that's exactly why it's so important that we do have renewal. And that to me really speaks to the power of where this network is right now. The people aren't asking what can the network do for my institution, but they're asking what can my institution do from the network. 
So I want to celebrate two things today. I want to celebrate the first five institutions that are participating in the pilot cohort of renewal, uh, as well as while we celebrate the six schools that are joining the network for the first time. But I also want to celebrate the value of the entire community that created this focus on continual learning, collective learning, and putting the field before the self. Because the Changemaker campuses are really a reflection of all of us. They're a reflection of the entire community. And so I think it speaks volumes about where this community is and where the conversation is that we're even able to do something like renewal. So just one more brief word before we turn to celebrating the six new schools joining the network that as we started talking more and more about renewal and how to keep schools in the network and keep the standard raised, we also started talking about why are we still bringing schools into the network? What is the value of that? Why don't we just stop at 30? And really we came back to this concept that Aaron brought up earlier of institutional diversity, of how it's so important that we have schools across all geographic areas, all types, any type of institution you imagine should be able to look at a change maker campus and see a part of themselves reflected in there. And so we're bringing in new schools that bring increasing diversity of different types to the network. But I also just want to point out that the standards of joining the network have been raising continually over the past several years. And so these schools have met these high standards, often exceeded these high standards, with some of the most innovative, creative, enthusiastic, cross-campus programs that we've ever seen before. And I think that that really speaks to the quality and the caliber of the Changemaker campuses this year. It's just such an extraordinary cohort. So now, please join me in recognizing both the old and new institutions that have successfully gone through the Changemaker campus selection process. Here to present the award to Claremont McKenna College is Elizabeth Schmidt, the director of Mason Center for Social Entrepreneurship and the faculty director of, of the Masters of Social Entrepreneurship. Hi, uh, accepting the award on behalf of Claremont McKenna College are change leaders Neela Rajendra, director of the um, Entrepreneurial Initiatives, and Amy Bibbins, director of the Center for Civic Engagement. <laughs> Claremont McKenna. Claremont McKenna began as an innovative, socially responsive institution serving veterans. Today, it continues to honor that mission through its educational philosophy of liberal arts in action. This college has found a unique blend of traditional liberal arts with a practical and fiercely action-oriented pedagogy. Two points illustrate this uh, commitment to liberal arts in action. First, their widespread social sector internship program provides students with funding, faculty support, and academic credit. Second, their students are actively involved in every major decision involving institutional change. Claremont McKenna's identity as, a liberal, art, as liberal arts in action is a rich new model for social innovation in higher education. It's focused on developing empathy, creativity, and courage, which are indispensable capacities for change makers. Please join me in celebrating the designation of Claremont McKenna College as a change maker campus. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Congratulations to Claremont McKenna. The next renewal change leader who will present the designation for Colorado College is Matt Nash, change leader at Duke University, managing director of social entrepreneurship, Duke Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiative, center director of social entrepreneurship accelerator at Duke, and center for the advancement of social entrepreneurship at Duke. Thank you. Accepting the award on behalf of Colorado College is change leader Mike Edmonds, Vice President of Student Life. Mike, why don't you join us? The physical setting of Colorado College in the American Southwest draws a unique type of student 
one who is eager to engage in sustainability and environmental work to bring about social action and social change. Colorado College's signature block plan is a uniquely intensive academic schedule that allows students to dive into different subject every three and a half weeks rather than balancing several classes at once throughout a semester. The schedule facilitates student innovation on a local, regional, and global scale by allowing students the opportunity to use a block or more to explore social problems and seek meaningful solutions through cross-disciplinary collaboration. As a result, Colorado College offers a field-leading model for seamless integration of learning and change-making. Please join me in celebrating the designation of Colorado College as a change-maker campus. Congratulations. Congratulations to Colorado College. The next Renewal Change Leader that will be announcing Fordham University is Cheryl Kaiser, Executive Director of the Lewis Institute and Babson Social Innovation Lab at Babson College. Good morning. Um, I'd love to invite Ron Jacobson to come up on the stage, who is representing Fordham University, and he's the Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs. Fordham University is New York's Jesuit university known for combining intellectual challenge with the dynamic resources of one of the world's greatest cities. Fordham's historic Bronx campus sits in the poorest congressional district in the United States, offering students and faculty a multitude of opportunities to bring impactful social change to local communities. The Graduate Education School is running a number of at-risk New York City public schools, while the School of Social Service combines management with advocacy and social justice. Biology is linked with conservation law, and philosophy is home to environmental studies, and beyond local borders, Fordham business students are creating U.S. markets for fair trade products from Kenya and India. Fordham embodies the change maker values that are at the core of the Ashoka U vision. Please join me in celebrating the designation of Fordham University as a change maker campus. Congratulations to Fordham University. The next renewal change leader announcing Glasgow Caledonia University is Garrett Westlake, Associate Dean of Student Entrepreneurship at Arizona State University. Good morning. Accepting the award on behalf of Glasgow Caledonian University is President and Vice Chancellor, Professor Pamela Gillies. Glasgow Caledonian University's Chancellor is Nobel Laureate Muhammad Yunus. It has campuses in Glasgow, London, New York, and is a university for the common good. With 35% of students from poor backgrounds and a 95% employment rate. Committed to embedding social entrepreneurship in its curriculum, the university strives to deliver social impact and benefit. It was the first university winner of the prestigious Unilever Global Development Award for its Grameen Caledonian College of Nursing in partnership with the Grameen Healthcare Trust. GCU is the top modern university for research power in Scotland, supported by its centers for excellence in research, including the Eunice Center for Social Business and Health and its Climate Justice Center established with the Mary Robinson Foundation. Please join me in celebrating the designation of Glasgow Caledonian University as a Changemaker Campus. Congratulations to Glasgow Caledonia University. The next renewal change leader who will be announcing Hamilton College is Rebecca Otten, Associate Director of Social Innovation and Engagement at Tulane University. Accepting the award on behalf of Hamilton College is Patrick Reynolds, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of Faculty. Patrick. Patrick. 
Hamilton College was conceived more than 200 years ago by a missionary who viewed education as part of the solution to the difficulties that confronted the Oneida Indians he served. And it was named for a statesman whose education vaulted him from poverty to prominence in the New Republic. Today, Hamilton College seeks to nourish in students a deep self-knowledge, a robust understanding of the complexity of social problems, and an ability to imagine and empathetically respond to the experience of others, and a creative spirit for envisioning novel solutions to long-standing social problems. Hamilton College achieves rigorous change-making learning outcomes through progressively challenging educational opportunities. These opportunities begin with introductory exposure to and courses in social innovation, advance through the Social Innovation Fellows Program, and culminate in the possibility of a postgraduate social innovation fellowship that awards $25,000 to a senior to develop and implement a social innovation venture that provides vital products or services to disadvantaged households in the local communities around Utica, New York. Please join me in celebrating the designation of Hamilton College as a changemaker campus. Congratulations. Congratulations to Hamilton College. Okay, is everyone ready? This is the big moment. We're about to have our 30th Changemaker Campus. So everyone needs to be excited. <laughs> it's a big deal. Finally, this is not a renewal change leader, but to present the award to Western Washington University is none other than the president of University of Maryland, Wallace Lowe. Good morning. It is my great pleasure to introduce Western Washington University and uh, accepting this award is the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs, Mr. Brent Carbajal. Could you please stand up? Some of you may know that um, I used to be the dean of the University of Washington Law School. And during my years, that was back in my salad days, but I got to know Western Washington University very well. So I think it's only by accident that I've been asked to introduce your institution. But located in one of the most gorgeous cities in the Pacific Northwest or in the country, Bellingham, halfway between Seattle and Vancouver, British Columbia. It is an extraordinary school. I probably have recruited, I would think, during the time I was dean, over 100 students from your university. They are the most talented, the most engaged. So when I was given the script that you have over 250 student organizations committed to social change and sustainability, I said, I do believe it because that is the types of students I saw at the University of Washington. And your motto is active minds, changing lives, and you live that motto in your institution. Welcome to Changemakers, the network. Congratulations. Now, President Lowe will be giving us a few more of his thoughts. Uh, I'm supposed to say something. <laughs> well, thank you. I, well, this is an incredible turnout. 700 people, you said? Um, look, I, I, I think this is such an incredible gathering. Do you mind if I take a photo, a selfie of myself? <laughs> and uh, th this will just take a second. But, you know, I've got to put it on my Twitter account. <laughs> First, I have to unlock. And here we go. <laughs> so, I mean, I know I have 20,000 students following me. 
and they are eager to know what I'm doing this snowy morning because they wanted the campus closed. <laughs> you are in the nation's capital, the only city in the world that shuts down with half an inch of snow. <laughs> but it is a pleasure to be here, and it is really very exciting. I think we should give a shout out to Ashoka for convening the 2015 exchange. And I want to thank my colleagues from the University of Maryland who have participated in helping organize this program. I believe it's the Smith School of Business and their Center for Social Value Creation, the School of Public Policy and their program in um, philanthropy and nonprofit leadership, the College of uh, Behavioral and Social Sciences, their deans are here. There must be other units that are involved. But I'm told that all of you will be going to campus on whenever it is, on Saturday. Wow, how are you gonna get there? <laughs> well, uh, in any event, uh, welcome to the University of Maryland on Saturday. And um, well, I, I, I know we also have some students from the University of Maryland. How many of you are students? Oh, I see six or seven hands. <laughs> Well, the rest of you, uh, you're coming to the campus. Our mascot is a terrapin. We call ourselves the Terps. So, um, by the authority vested in me as president, I appoint you all honorary Terps when you come to campus on Saturday. We should give a shout out to the change makers in this room. Because as the motto of Ashoka says, everyone a change maker, everyone an innovator and a social entrepreneur, change makers are the future of this world. So when I raise my arm, I want you to yell as loud as you can to make the walls tremble. Change maker. We are the future belongs to we want to do good, serve others, make an impact, because we are Thank you. You know, I was flying back uh, the other day, and I had the misfortune of being seated next to a very loquacious business person who was telling me all about his business deals and so forth. And finally, uh, he said, well, so what business are you in? I thought about it for a moment. I couldn't resist. And I said, I am in the immortality business. <laughs> oh, so you're a preacher. <laughs> I said, no. I am in the business of education. I'm in the business of transforming people's lives, where they acquire the values and the skills and the mindsets to make a difference in the world that has an impact on a whole range of people, has an impact on their family, their ch on their children and their children's children. Because the mission of an educator reaches out and touches eternity. That is why we are educators, we in this room, and fundamental to our mission is change making. I heard it once from a fellow of Ashoka, and I'll repeat what he said. If you give a person a fish, that person has a meal. If you teach that person to fish, that person has a meal for a lifetime. However, if you teach that person to innovate the fishing industry, that person creates jobs, grows the economy, and feeds the whole village. That is what change making is. Change making is Ben Simon. I don't know if he's in the room, but I met him three years ago when he was a junior. And he came up with this incredible idea that he presented at our Duga Challenge Hundreds of students compete in this, in this uh, competition, this social entrepreneurship competition. And his idea was brilliant in its simplicity. He noticed that all the food 
in the various cafeterias on campus and at the stadiums and elsewhere. That food, under public health laws, has to be disposed of, cannot be saved and reused. So he came up with the idea of mobilizing students, teaching them about public health laws, assembling all that food, and taking it down to homeless shelters in Washington and Baltimore. Thus began the Food Recovery Network that four years later is at 95 campuses around the country. And one early morning, I flipped on the television and on some national network, there is Ben Simon. And the reporter or the anchor is asking him, so what's your vision? He looked at the anchor in the eye. He said, my vision is to end hunger in America. If all 5,000 colleges in this country had the Food Recovery Network, we will end hunger in America. That is the change-making mindset and attitude that will change the world. One of the, one of the classics is Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville. He wrote back in the 1840s or thereabouts. And by the way, when I use the word classic, I don't mean a book in the sense that Mark Twain used the word classic, a book that everybody quotes but nobody reads. <laughs> it is a classic in the sense that it's a book that stands the test of time, that has insights that speaks to generations and not just to people of that generation. And he said that what makes American democracy unique, that makes it so special, is that people come together and collaborate and help solve community issues, societal issues, and thereby develop the, the qualities and the skills of collaboration and empathy and civic engagement. I think that is a fundamental insight because giving back, making a difference, helping others is nothing but citizenship in action. That is what makes American democracy work because to be an American is not a spectator sport. It is to be an active participant resolving the issues of our society. And that kind of a mindset it's not inborn. It is learned. It is taught in the classroom. It is acquired by experiential learning, participating in the actual activities, hands-on. Every fall, I speak to the freshman class, some 4,500, 5,000 students. And I tell them one number that I ask them to remember, one in 1,000. Only one in 1,000 people on this planet have the opportunity of a college education. So I urge them to remember, you are one of the privileged few. What will you do with that education when you graduate? How would you give back? Because this opportunity was given to you. I'm from the old school. I believe that education has a moral dimension. That we as educators are called not only to help students think, to communicate clearly and cogently, but also to care. To apply their knowledge and their skills for the causes of justice, environmental sustainability, human betterment, and compassion in a world that is greatly in need of these blessings. Change making is an acquired trait and skill. And I think of one of the greatest change makers among American presidents is Abraham Lincoln. Back in 1862, at the moment of the greatest existential crisis of our nation, Abraham Lincoln 
signed the Morrill Act, creating the land-grant college. This was one of the first most significant innovations in higher education. Higher education limited previously to the privileged few, focused on the classical liberal education. He transformed higher education with two major ideas. Number one, he democratized it. He opened it to other people, making it more affordable and more accessible. And number two, applying knowledge to solving practical issues, the land-grant ideal. And at the University of Maryland back in 1863, our first major project was comparing the efficacy of 10 different types of fertilizer to improve agricultural production. And today in the 21st century, what we do, or some of our extension agents do, is they go to Baltimore, to the inner city, and they have Grow It and Eat It, that's the name of the program, teaching inner city residents how to grow food right in the middle of Baltimore. They grow 20 to 30,000 pounds of food. But it's not just growing food for them to eat, but they also learn about nutrition, about proper diet, in order to reduce incidence of diabetes and heart disease. The land-grant idea, of course, is now spread throughout most universities and colleges in the country. That was the first major innovation in American higher education. The second major innovation around the turn of the 20th century, the creation of the so-called, what I call, the, land grand, uh, the federal grant university, the research university. Of course, the research mission belongs to almost all colleges these days, but the notion that the federal government will fund research. Unlike, for example, in Europe, Asia, South America, where there are governmental labs, and that's where research is done. In America, it is done in universities, combining research with education. But the question to be raised today is, in the 21st century, we've had the land-grant university, we've had, we have still, the federal grant university, what is the model of higher education for the 21st century? Well, it dawned upon me what that model was about a year and a half ago when I had the privilege of uh, going to Israel and having a meeting with then President Shimon Peres at the age of, at that time, 90 years old, sharp as a whip. And I said to him, uh, Mr. President, how long would it be before there is peace in this region? And of course, President Perez is now not just a politician, he's a statesperson, he's a philosopher. He says, Mr. Lowe, in this part of the world, the clocks have no hand. Well, given that philosophical answer, I said, may I ask something more practical? What would it take to bring peace to this part of the world. And he just brightened up. He had just come back from Nazareth, which as you know, is a predominantly uh, composed of Arab Israelis. And he said, and he had just inaugurated a uh, innovation incubator at Nazareth. He responded instantly. He said, create 1,000 innovation incubators. This was shortly after the Arab Spring. And he said, you know, this is not about ideology. This is about young people without hope, without opportunity, without jobs. And the solution is innovation. And then I remember reading on the front page of the New York Times, and I'm sure you all saw this. It was a searing image of the Occupy Wall Street movement. This young woman standing there with a sign that said, young, educated, unemployed. One of the biggest issues of the 21st century is jobs, and jobs, and jobs. There are millions and millions of more people in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, who in the old days would be working out in the fields, and today they're joining the middle class, coming to America for higher education. And I tell the students from the University of Maryland, when you graduate, you're competing not only against the graduates from Baltimore and uh, Boston, but from Bangalore, Brasilia, and Beijing. And the competition is not just for economics jobs. It's also for making this a better world, for social entrepreneurship and social innovation. 
So when people ask me, what is my vision for the University of Maryland in the 21st century? I say it is no longer sufficient to be a research university. We have to be a research and innovation university. What that means is, and this is probably true for many other universities and colleges, we are an ivory tower, and we should be an ivory tower. And the top of that tower, great thoughts are being developed and created and add to the storehouse, storefront, uh, storehouse of human knowledge, and those great ideas are transmitted to the next generation. But what we need in the 21st century, at the bottom of that tower, are innovation incubators that translate those ideas to practical impact, what I call eye to eye, ideas to impact. Impact meaning innovation. How to better feed people, how to better house people, how to better heal people, how to better educate them, how to better transport them, how to better secure them, how to better improve their lives via innovation and entrepreneurship. So my goal is a very simple one. We have 38,000 students. My goal is that every single one of those students will be exposed to the mindset, the skills, the way of life of innovation and entrepreneurship. And I'm told that currently we're reaching approximately 25, 30% of our student body. And if their plan is on track, we should be able to reach 100% within about another four years. And we're doing it in many different ways, but basically it is innovation and entrepreneurship across the whole curriculum embedded in the majors. These are not courses that are separate. The idea came to me when I was visiting an alumna in uh, somewhere in California, Santa Monica, I believe. And she was the first CEO of a major uh, movie studio. And she graduated from Maryland many years ago with a degree in theater. She said, I got a wonderful education. But if you continue educating theater students the way you educated me, they're not going to be productive in the 21st century. And I said, no, what do you mean? She says, do you really think that people are going to be, or most people are going to be watching theater productions the way they've been watching it throughout the centuries? I said, well, how are they going to be watching it? So she pulls out her, her smartphone, mobile devices. And to choreograph a production for, to be viewed on a mobile device is very different than choreographing it to be viewed live on stage. And you have to train students, she said, in the basic skills of doing that, knowing about technology, knowing about marketing, knowing about fundraising, because if you don't communicate those skills, they will not be prepared for the 21st century. And that does not mean sending them to the business school or sending them to the engineering school. It means bringing in artists who are already using those skills and embedding that in existing theater courses. That is the kind of embedding that we're trying to do. And we're also doing MOOCs. I'm really proud of the fact that we have a MOOC on innovation and entrepreneurship that has 240,000 students every time it's offered. 240,000 students from around the world. And the question is, can we adapt it to use it on campus to reach only 38,000 students? Let me just conclude by saying this. Since all of you are now honorary Terps, let me explain to you, in case you didn't know, what a Terrapin is. The terrapin is a little turtle that's unique to Chesapeake Bay. And it has a really lovable quality. That turtle can only move forward. It doesn't know how to move back. And how does that turtle move forward? One step at a time and sticking its neck out. Change making is a state of mind. It's a set of skills. Change making, you know, 
the only way I can describe change making is a wonderful Yiddish word that doesn't exist in any other language, chutzpah. To be a change maker, you have to have chutzpah. You have to think big. You have to aim high. You have to take risks. You have to persevere. You have to never give up and never give in. That is what a change maker is. Change makers will change the world. Go! Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all here. I am Bita Ansari, Ashoka U's Exchange Director. And before we get started with our agenda today, I wanted to share some final last minute announcements to help you navigate the next three days. First and foremost, it's a pleasure to welcome you all. It is so great to see you here. I know you've put up with lots of emails, lots of updates, lots of questions from me. Thank you for your patience. We've put together a fantastic agenda that we're so, so incredibly proud of. This year represents the biggest Ashokyu exchange to date. We have 700 participants here, including 100 all-star stellar students. You all represent, that's right. Our attendees represent over 150 institutions from 28 countries. It is by far the biggest, most diverse representation we've had to date. This year, we're also proud to announce that we've selected four exchange scholars. Ashokuyi was able to award a limited number of scholarships to exchange attendees who represent community colleges, a vastly underrepresented group in this conversation. They are included in your program. Um, if you happen to see any of our four scholars, please walk up to them and welcome them to the conversation. I believe they're all first time exchange attendees this year. We've also seen our average delegation size grow to over three participants per university. This is also a record for the exchange. Looking forward, we've put together an action-packed three days. We've got 100 speakers spread across, across more than 60 sessions. If you haven't already, please pick up an exchange program. They're available at the registration desk up one floor from here. The program includes everything and anything you need to know to navigate the next three days. It's got speakers, locations, maps, shuttle information. It's gonna be your guide to make sure you have an effective and valuable exchange experience. We've put together today and tomorrow, we'll be here at the Grand Hyatt Hotel all day long. On Saturday, we'll have shuttles for you and we'll take everybody to the University of Maryland campus. As you look through your agenda, you'll see that there are certain sessions marked as advanced. All this means is that they'll be including innovations and ideas that rely on already existing either institutional support, funding, or significant staff leadership and time. All are still welcome to join these sessions. We're also offering four site visits this year two this morning and two after lunch. Slots on the site visit are limited and they're gonna be allocated on a first come, first serve basis. If you would like to attend, we recommend getting there about 15 to 20 minutes before the start time. You can go up to the, grant, the lobby, up two floors from here. Ashoka staff will meet you there to guide you on the buses. We also have two special invitation only tracks that are taking place at the exchange this year our third president, provost, and trustee track, as well as the inaugural changemaker education tract, which is designed to envision the future of K through 12 education. While these are special tracks, there will be an open session from both of them on the agenda tomorrow. One will feature education school deans, and we'll also have a session featuring university presidents. Both are included in your program on tomorrow's agenda. We also, you might have noticed next door, we have a special MICA social design lab. This is the first time we're doing something like this, and it was in response to what we heard from you, exchange attendees, last year. We wanted to create a space that was highly experiential and participatory. And we've posed a question to you, our exchange audience. 
How might we advance social innovation in higher education? We want to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your challenges, your suggestions. Drop by, let them know what you think, how you want to tackle this problem. They're going to take all of your answers and they're going to help us facilitate ideas and solutions as what we as a community have come up with together. And we're excited to share our results with you post exchange. Finally, I want to extend a special thank you to our host, the University of Maryland. It has been a pleasure working with the UMD team, and we couldn't have done this without each and every one of you. We'd also like to thank our wonderful sponsors for the 2015 exchange, including the Moxie Foundation, Western Union, the Cordes Foundation, Tulane University, Hillel Ask Big Questions, Micah Social Design, Middlebury College, Babson College, the University of Northampton, Tecnologico de Monterrey, Colorado College, and the J.M. Kaplan Fund. And I'd like to end by thanking each and every one of you, our exchange audience. We couldn't do it without you, and we truly appreciate the time you've taken to come here. You've shared your ideas, your innovations with us. It's been a pleasure for us to learn about what you're doing and spread them through our agenda and through all the different sessions that we have today. As you move forward through the next three days, we ask you keep an open mind and an open heart. We hope you walk away with new collaborators, new partners, fresh perspectives, and new ideas. Thank you for coming to the Ashoka U Exchange.